On the first day of COP21 in Paris, a coalition of willing nations demonstrated an agile and very good political response to the climate emergency by setting up mission innovation. And since then, governments and their scientists have delivered remarkable advances in developing the wide variety of breakthrough technologies needed in a post-fossil fuel world. Uh, collaboration between the participatory countries has been strengthened. But now let me say the efforts need to be quadrupled going forward in time, given the growing emergency of climate change. So far, last year, we were spending $23 billion a year. The objective was $30 billion a year. And I think we know why we didn't achieve that. But now the objective has been set at 40 to $45 billion a year by 2025. The private sector has already stepped in uh, to garner the benefits of the most promising techniques emerging uh, and taking them to the marketplace. And that's exactly what the whole thing was designed for. It's designed to get more quickly into the marketplace with all of the technologies needed in the 21st century energy systems and also other systems as well. Now, let me also say, we need to develop a much more sophisticated scheme of international workshops and conferences throughout the year to bring scientists from each country and the engineers together to discuss particular uh, issues under the banner of mission innovation. I need to know that every scientist and engineer working in a closely related field to this, it knows about mission innovation through these workshops and conferences. That's my first challenge to you. My second challenge is that the, the world has already benefited enormously from the rapidly falling costs of renewable energy systems. Renewable energies are now installed around the world in greater abundance than new fossil fuel energy systems producing electricity. And the reason is because regulatory systems were introduced first in Germany in 1989, Britain 1997, across the whole of Europe in the early 2000s. These, these regulatory systems were introduced so that the new technologies could compete with the mature technologies developed under the fossil fuel heading. And what, this was absolutely vital because now these new renewable energy technologies being taken into the marketplace around the world are getting there on competition alone and without any regulation required. So this is a very important part of what I think this group of willing nations, the 25 nations represented now in Mission Innovation, what this group needs to focus on is how can we together develop the regulatory systems, the carbon pricing, whatever is required to accelerate the business of getting all of the new technologies being developed under Mission Innovation into the marketplace. That's not a trivial ask. I'm actually saying at the next meeting, of mission innovation in Glasgow in, in November this year, let's meet and bring in heads of governments wherever possible of those 25 nations to make this commitment, to make national actions become international actions amongst the 25 nations. These nations representing 80% 80, 80 of the global GDP can really transition the whole world very quickly if we do this. Now, let me also say a few words about the rapidly emerging challenges of climate change. So I'm now changing over to just give you a quick overview. The, the next slide, sorry, my first slide actually shows the uh, Mission Innovation Heads of Government standing under the banner uh, at COP21 on the first day. And that's what I want to see repeated uh, at the COP26 in Glasgow this year. The next slide uh, takes you to the uh, state of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere today. And this curve just runs from 1700, the pre-industrial era, out to uh, 20, 2010, 2020, sorry, 2020 this year, uh, last year. And what we see is greenhouse gases in total 
have now reached 500 parts per million plus. And that's because we're adding in in this figure uh, the methane and other greenhouse gases, which of course you must do in any proper analysis. Many, many people are talking about 415 parts per million. We're way beyond that. And we really have to keep remembering to count total greenhouse gases as a CO2 equivalent and not just carbon dioxide. This means that we are now at a very, very dangerous level. I don't even believe that we do have a carbon budget that could be spent safely to stay within 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial level, which is, of course, the target set in Paris. So what are, what are the consequences of this? The worst consequences are now happening up in the Arctic Circle region. The Arctic Circle has now heated up at over three degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level and the rest of the world at 1.1 degrees. So the Arctic Circle region heating up three times the rate of the rest of the planet. And the whole world will respond to what is now happening in the Arctic Circle, summarized very briefly in this slide. In the center picture, you see the Northern Hemisphere with the North Pole at the top, and a temperature isotherm system shown there indicating that the North Pole is no longer the warmest place of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, sorry, the coldest place of the Northern Hemisphere. And the reason is because the Arctic ice has been rapidly melting over the last 20 years until the point has been reached where during the Arctic summer, the blue sea, which absorbs sunlight during that polar summer, is now exposed 50% of the Arctic sea to sunlight. And this is the reason one of the major reasons why this region is heating up so very quickly. The uh, polar vortex, which was a circular wind, is now a distorted circular wind around the Arctic Circle region, and it's meandering. But you'll see in this particular picture uh, that the region between Canada and the United States was the coldest region of the Northern Hemisphere at this point. And this meandering means that the weather changes quite dramatically now in the Northern Hemisphere. On the left-hand side is Greenland, sitting now during the Arctic polar summer in a warm blue sea. When all the ice on Greenland has melted, global sea levels, global sea levels will have risen by seven and a half meters, 23 feet. And of course, the map of the world will dramatically change and all of our global cities will no longer be livable. It'll take quite some time to lose that amount of ice. But it's very clear now that we have to be planning, unless we can manage to avoid this, we have to be planning for a sea level rise by the end of the century of two to four meters and not half a meter as we were planning before. On the right-hand side is another risk up in the Arctic Circle region. There's a vast amount of methane trapped in the permafrost, and the permafrost is now emitting methane, and in the northern region of Russia, explosive releases of methane are now occurring on a fairly frequent basis. Methane is a very significant greenhouse gas, and this all really has to be managed if we're going to avoid a catastrophe uh, going into the future. Next slide, please. Just shows one of the catastrophic effects of what is happening in the Arctic Circle region. You'll see here a map of Vietnam. And on the left, the prediction of flooding at high tide, that's ocean flooding in Vietnam. And you'll see a significant part of the country flooded in 30 years time on an annual basis. If we then take you over to the right-hand side, this is the latest projection. These two projections made 10 years apart, the latest projection taking into account everything I've just been telling you about. You'll see that <coughs> Vietnam is essentially underwater at least once a year, 90% of the country. No longer producing rice. The biggest rice paddy fields in the world are there. But of course, across the water, Indonesia, the whole of Southeast Asia, suffering along these lines. Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, the capital, will be unlivable unless something is managed uh, by the time we get to mid-century, already heavily flooded in January this year.
So there's the, the, just a snapshot of the nature of the new challenges we're faced with. Uh, what, what I now need to look at is how we manage to go forward. Next slide. We know that country after country is now following the notion of net zero emission targets by 2050. That was first made by the British government in 2017. Now the nations that together have made this commitment amount to about 70% of the, of the global GDP. Uh, we need to achieve that and recognize that this is a major wealth creation opportunity for the private sector. Mission Innovation is really aimed at delivering on that program. But what we need to do to get net zero is to create greenhouse gas sinks so that the continued emission, for example, from farmlands where methane emission is inevitable, uh, but also from re remaining human activities that cannot be re reduced to zero, will have to be uh, reduced by removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. So the big new target is to create new large-scale greenhouse gas sinks to take us to net zero and beyond safely and at low cost. Today, the big message from the Arctic Circle region is that we've already got too much in the way of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That 500 parts per million, in my view, needs to be brought down to 350 parts per million by the end of the century <coughs> in order to create a safe world for our civilization to continue to develop in. Next slide, please. <coughs> I'm just listing here, and I won't dwell on them, a range of greenhouse gas removal technologies that are being investigated, many of these here in the UK and in other part, uh, countries in the 25 members of the Mission Innovation States. I would like to see Mission Innovation activities focus in on these greenhouse gas removal technologies. This list is not meant to be comprehensive. And I believe, in, in my view, the most promising are the marine-based technologies, the third one down, including marine permaculture, coastal upwelling to develop marine kelp, seaweed farms, etc., and deep ocean fertilization. And we need experiments funded by public money through government's mission innovation to see that all of these things can be achieved without negative consequences. Uh, the fourth bullet point is focused on methane removal, and there's just one technique discussed there for methane removal. We need considerably more activity focused down on this area. Next slide, please. What I'm focusing on here is this is what the public sector research needs to focus on. One, technological feasibility. Two, scalability. What is the scalability in terms of CO2 sequestration potential? Uh, we need to focus on removing billions of tons of carbon dioxide per annum, and we need to do this at low cost. And then potential adverse impacts, especially on energy consumption, rainfall and water supply, biodiversity and food production, land use. We need to make sure that we get co-benefits and not disincentives. And a big co-benefit is to see that we develop biodiverse systems at the same time as capturing greenhouse gases. And the next slide. I just want to finally make an important point about working globally. Let's not make the same mistake that has been made over COVID-19 with vaccine manufacture. We all know that COVID-19 is a global problem, and unless it's eliminated globally, it will continue to be with us and with us all into the future. We have to see that vaccines are made available globally. In the same way, I'm saying that climate change is a global problem, and we need to see that equitable policies and solutions are available for all countries. Governments, scientists and investors will need to focus on seeing that we are dealing with that international problem. But we also need to dynamically improve our actions, the speed of action to deliver across the world at pace. Thank you very much.